it's, it's a pleasure for me to be here. And since I didn't know uh, exactly what the audience was going to be, I'm going to give a very low-level talk. Uh, so one, one of the things is we're having an information revolution, and, and it's going to change the lives. And the impact is going to be similar to the agricultural or the industrial uh, revolution. And so as I said, I'm going to give a, a short uh, description of uh, AI, and then I'll talk about a few research uh, projects. Uh, the key element uh, is a threshold logic gate. It has a number of inputs and an output, and each input has a weight on it. Uh, that's the W1, W2, and then you put an input, which is the Xs. And this device uh, computes the uh, sum of the input times the weights and compares it with the threshold. Uh, if it's less than the threshold, it outputs a zero. If it's greater than the threshold, it outputs a one. And I'm, I'm simplifying things because this is not exactly how, it, how it's done, but it, this is roughly correct. Uh, and here is an algorithm for training a threshold logic unit uh, to separate some data. So my data is the uh, A1, A2 up to AN. And the algorithm, first I set the weight vector to the first pattern. And then I repeatedly cycle through all patterns uh, until they're all classified correctly. And if an input is not classified correctly, then I add it or subtract it to the, from the weight vector. And what's important about this algorithm is you'll notice that the weight vector is a linear combination of the patterns. And that, that's something which is going to be very important in a, in a couple of slides. Uh, if the data is linearly separable, the algorithm will find a, a hyperplane separating it. But what, what if the data is not linearly separable? Well, what you might do, I want to separate the zeros from the x's. What I might do is map the data to a higher dimensional space. So um, I might add another uh, dimension, z, where I'm going to pull the data out from the board by an about proportional to its distance from the origin. So that means the zeros will be pulled out further than the x's, and there will be a hyperplane which separates uh, the zeros from the x's. Now, it may be that this mapping is going to be to an infinite dimensional space. And it turns out that you do not need to compute uh, uh, images of, of the patterns in the high dimensional space. One only needs products of the images. So what I might do, I take my pattern, and you're thinking of it in a high dimensional space, F maps it there, and I have a weight vector. But remember that if I run this algorithm in the high dimensional space, uh, the weight vector will be a linear sum of these images. Now, if I want to know if a pattern is mapped correctly, I have to multiply this image uh, times the weight vector. But you'll notice that I don't need to know f. All I need to know is the product of f of ai and f of aj. Uh, so what I might do, oh, and one thing, if I have to update the weight vector, uh, I have to add this mapping to the weight vector. But to do that, all I have to do is increase the coefficient of f of aj. So I can run this algorithm without knowing f as long as I know the products of f of ai and f of aj. So this leads to something called a kernel. What we'll do is we'll create a matrix k where the elements of k are products of f of ai and f of aj. And one such kernel uh, is the Gaussian kernel. You notice I can quickly calculate Kij. I simply take Ai minus Aj, square it, multiply it by a constant, and raise e to that power. Uh, to calculate the kernel, I didn't need to know the function f. Now, what you might ask is, can one select any matrix for k that they want? Uh, well, you have to uh, select uh, a matrix. Uh, for which there exists a function. Uh, that's the only requirement. 
And uh, there's a simple theorem that says there exists a function f if and only if the matrix K is positive semi-definite. Uh, so that means uh, that I can run this algorithm uh, without worrying about this function f. And this is the technology that is in what was called support vector machines. Uh, uh, and if you purchased any AI technology uh, prior to about 2012, it probably had this technology in it. Uh, there are many other kernels besides the Gaussian kernel. You simply select one which is appropriate for the type of problem that you're doing. Uh, the next advance is in deep learning. And so I thought I would explain deep learning also. Uh, <clears throat> turns out the deep learning came about because of something called an image net competition. Uh, th uh, there were uh, 1.2 million images from a thousand categories and the images were labeled. And so there was a competition that worked in the following way. Uh, if you wanted to develop an algorithm to recognize whether an image was a cat or a dog or a tree uh, and enter this contest, you were given 50,000 images uh, in 100 categories and the images were labeled as to which category they came from. You developed an algorithm and then you submitted it. And the way your algorithm was tested is they tested it on 10,000 other images which you had not seen. Uh, it turns out that in 2011, the error rate of the winning algorithm was about 25%. And in previous years, uh, the, the error rate was reduced by only about one-tenth of a percent a year. But in uh, 2012, AlexNet came along and the error rate dropped to 15%. This was such a tremendous improvement uh, that people tried this technology in many different disciplines, in, in medicine, in finance, in manufacturing. And wherever they tried it, it seemed to work. Uh, but we don't know why it works. Uh, but people then worked on it, and they kept improving the technology till now with ResNet, the error rate is less than 4%. Uh, a trained human uh, has an error rate of about 5%. Uh, so computers can now classify images better uh, than, than humans. I thought I would show you what the technology, this AlexNet technology is. <clears throat> um, there is something called a convolution level. So this big picture here is, is my image. Uh, typically, it might actually be 28 by 28, uh, depending on what size image you had. But you take a little three by three window and connect it to a gate. And there are nine inputs to this gate, and each has a weight. And then you slide this window across one cell at a time till you get to the end. Then you move it down a row and slide it across. But uh, at each position, it has the same set of weights. So there are only nine weights here that, that produce a new image. And what this is supposed to do is extract some, uh, researchers say, some low-level features. Uh, <clears throat> but you want to extract many different kinds of features. So you may have several hundred of these 3x3 three three windows. Okay. So that's sort of the convolution level. And to keep the networks reasonably small, there's then something called a pooling level. And in the pooling level, you have a little two by two window. And what you do is you simply pick the maximum value out of the four cells and reduce the size of your image by a factor of two in each dimension. Uh, this is just to reduce the number of weights in the total network. Uh, the total number of weights is going to be about a million. So you can see why you want to keep it reasonably small. And uh, in AlexNet, there were actually five of these convolution levels, uh, then three fully connected levels, and then something called softmax, which uh, produced the actual output. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about various types of learning. Uh, there's supervised learning, where you put in an image and you adjust the weights to get the correct classification. 
Another thing you might be interested in is unsupervised learning, because this is the technology that's going to drive your automobile. And what you would kind of like, well, you're not going to be able to train your automobile for every situation it's going to encounter. So you would like the uh, automobile to kind of learn how to drive better as it's driving you around. Uh, so one possibility for unsupervised learning is to put in an image and try to reproduce the image. Now you might ask, how can I uh, take this image, which is higher dimensional than the higher dimensional representations inside? And, and the answer is, you're not going to look at every possible image. Uh, you're only going to look at a few million, and there's enough uh, uh, dimensions here that uh, you could have a code for trillions of trillions of images. So it's possible to train this network to reproduce the image. And what you believe you might do then is be selecting features here uh, from this image, which would help you in classification, even though you don't know what category this image is in. I'm going to talk about activation vectors. Uh, <clears throat> what I might do is put in an image here and create a vector where the coordinates of this vector correspond to the outputs of these gates. And I'm going to call that an activation vector. Now it turns out there are two types of activation vectors. Uh, what I could do is I could put an image in and create the uh, output of each gate. That's in the what was on the previous slide. Or I could take one gate and put all images in. And that would sort of be an, uh, a neuron activation vector where this is an image activation vector. And I'm just going to talk about uh, image activation vectors. Uh, and now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to show you a little bit of research that could be done. I, I wanted to take that initial time just so that everybody would sort of understand what a deep network was and uh, so on. So one thing you could do is you could take an image and you could produce its activation vector. That would be very simple. You simply put the image into the computer and you look what the output of each gate is. Uh, but what if I gave you an activation vector and said, what image produced it? Uh, there are many ways to, to answer this question. I'm just going to show you the simplest way that's to, to explain. Uh, what you could do is you could take a random image and produce its activation vector. Then you could do gradient descent on the pixels of this random image to move this activation vector to this one. So sort of like that. This is just gradient descent. And if you do that, what will happen is you will convert your random image to the image that produced this activation vector. So here's something you can do. I, I take my deep network, I take an activation vector here, and I'm going to call that the content of the image. Then what I can do is I can go over here and take an activation vector, and actually I'm going to take the cross product of the activation vector with itself and get a matrix, and I'm going to call this the style of the image. Now I can recreate the image using the style of a different image. So one of the experiments we did, we took an image of one of our former presidents, uh, and we found the content of this image. But then we took um, 200 images of older people, and we averaged together their style. And we recreated this image and asked, what would the president look like if he was 20 years older? And this is what we got. Now, I'm, I'm going to tell you an interesting story uh, because uh, I used to bring uh, 30 juniors from China over to Cornell for a month to expose them 
to an American university. Uh, my real reason for doing it is I wanted to have our faculty evaluate them and see if they wanted them for PhD students. Uh, but uh, each of these students did a little research project. Uh, these are juniors. They had never seen deep learning before. And here's what one did. He took a picture of Cornell University. And then he said, what would Cornell University look like if it was located in China? So he took a piece of Asian artwork. Uh, he used the content of this and the style of this. And he said, this is what Cornell would look like if it was in China. Uh, this is a junior, uh, never seen deep learning. And this is, is what he did. OK. So uh, one thing that would be interesting uh, I should mention that training these networks takes a lot of computer power. Uh, and it might take a week or two weeks to train a network. And what we asked the question, uh, for the different kinds of research we're doing, do we really need to train the network? What if we used random weights? So we did the following experiment. We took a, this is an image of Cornell. Uh, these are some styles, and we asked, what would this image look like if we recreated it by each of these styles? And if we had a pre-trained network, this is the result that you would get. But if you just used random weights, this is the result that you would get. It would be just as good. So one interesting research project is what, out of the things that we are doing, which things require training the network, and which require random weights. For example, if I could tell you how effective a given architecture would be without training it, then I could test thousands of uh, architectures in an hour or so, uh, whereas if I have to wait two weeks for each one, I just simply couldn't do the experiment. Uh, I suspect you're not going to be able to say how effective a network is going to be with random weights, but it's, it's interesting to figure out which things you can do with random weights and which you can't. I put up a, a, a set of research problems here. <coughs> Some of the questions are, uh, what, what do individual gates learn? Uh, does it learn that uh, in a human face that uh, the, the, there's an eye there or a nose or something? Uh, and how does what the second level gate learns differ from what the first level gate learns? Uh, how does what a gate learns evolves over time? Uh, this is another interesting one because another one of these juniors that I brought over to Cornell took a very small network, which he could train in just a few minutes. And he observed that when he was training that three gates started to learn the same thing. Then at some point, the two of the gates said, this doesn't make sense, and shifted and started to learn something else. And so an interesting research project is how does the gate decide what it should learn? Uh, if you train with two different sets of starting weights, <clears throat> so when you start to train a network, you put in a set of random weights, and then you train it. Uh, if I train it twice, do the gates learn the same thing? Or do the, the networks just learn totally different things? Uh, that it isn't a unique, unique set of features that allows the network to work. Uh, one of the things I should point out um, is the convolution level. Uh, the reason the word convolution is there is what it's really doing, in some sense, is taking a transform, like a Fourier transform and finding the frequency distribution of the image. And it's not probably not learning features that you would consider to be features, uh, but it's can, learning features in some other space. I'm going to talk a little bit about training uh, one of these networks. It turns out that there are many local minima. Oh, and the way you train the network is you have an error function. And you take the derivative of the error function with respect to the weights, 
and you try to adjust the weights to reduce the error function. Uh, and you, when you get to a local minima, some are better than others. What determines whether a local minima is a good one? And the other, uh, I'm going to talk about a way to speed up training. Uh, and, but let me first talk about uh, local minima. So I simplified this to one dimension where I just have one weight. Uh, and I have the, the training error here, and there's two local minima. One is broader than the other. Which one is going to have better generalization? Which is going to do better on images that it's never seen? Now, if your training data is a good statistical sample of the full data set, then you would expect that the error function for the full data set is very close to this. And this dotted line is the error function for the full data. Now notice that if it just shifts a little here, if it shifts a little, the change in error is very small at this broad minimum. But at a sharp minimum, it's gigantic. So you want to pick a uh, uh, broad minima. Okay. Uh, the other thing I want to talk about uh, is this gradient descent. Because remember, we have an error function, and there's an error for each image. And remember, you have 50,000 images. So this is a summation of 50,000 terms. You're taking the derivative uh, with respect to a million weights of a function which has 50,000 terms in it. Uh, wouldn't it be much faster if I just randomly picked one image, took the derivative, which would be 50,000 times faster, correct the weights, and then randomly pick a different image, take the derivative, correct the weights, and just cycle through. Uh, it turns out that this is a method called stochastic gradient descent, and it works uh, much, much faster. But what surprised me is it gave much better answers. And why is that? Well, if you have an error function, something like this, and you start with full gradient descent, so I have the complete error function, and I'm over here, I'm going to come down to this local minimum and stop. I'm probably going to get stuck in it. But if I'm doing stochastic gradient descent, when I have, if I'm over here, and I pick one image and take the derivative, with high probability, I'm going to move this way. And if I'm over here, with high probability, I'm going to move this way. I'm not always going to move the correct way, but statistically, I'm almost, almost always going to move the correct way and move down to this region. So what happens with stochastic gradient descent, you'll get down here and wander around. And then what I'll do, instead of taking just one image, I'll take maybe 50 images. And what that will do is that will reduce the variance at this level. And then finally, I'll do full gradient descent, and that's what gets me to a much better uh, error, error function. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some, some research uh, projects. Uh, if a child uh, learns two languages, when they're very young, there is one person, one position in the brain uh, where this process takes place. But if you learn two languages as an adult, the second language as an adult, there are two different positions in the brain, and basically you're translating back and forth. Whereas the child that learned early on, uh, he or she just has one language, which is just bigger. Uh, and so uh, one of the questions that comes up, if we have two tasks and we, learn, we could learn them separately, but is there some way we could figure out what is common to these two tasks? So why not learn them together? What if I take some of these uh, neurons and put them in both networks? And now if I train this composite network, for both tasks, what's likely to happen is these gates will learn what is similar to the two tasks, and these gates up here and these down here 
will learn which is specific to one or the other tasks. Uh, and I just put this up um, to just kind of illustrate the things that people are, can use these deep networks to explore. Uh, so this, this just basically says what we already know. Uh, if you learn one task and then another, or should you learn them together? Uh, and uh, can you extract what is, is, is common to them? Another issue is researchers were trying to generate images. So they would like to type into your computer uh, the word cat and have the computer generate an image of a cat. Now you might say, that's kind of silly. Why not just go on the network and find an image of a cat? But what you might want to do is get uh, a very special image. Uh, you might want a picture of a cat sitting on a bench next to you or something. Uh, the, the picture is sufficiently complex that you're not going to find that specific picture on the network. Uh, and it, so it would be nice to be able to type into your computer and generate images. Uh, researchers initially were very unsuccessful. Uh, they didn't get things that even looked like images. Uh, until they developed something called the Synthetic Ima Image Discriminator. And this was a network which you could feed in an image, and it would tell you whether it was a real image or a synthetically generated image. Then they took their image generator, and they uh, tried to adjust this image generator so it could fool the synthetic image discriminator. Uh, once they succeeded to do that, they took the synthetic image discriminator and trained it so this could no longer fool it. And as they worked this back and forth, pretty soon they started getting images out, which looked like real images. Uh, <clears throat> now this sounds like a, kind of a simple thing, but it turns out it's extremely important. Uh, because you can use this synthetic discriminator to do all kinds of interesting tasks. Uh, suppose I wanted to translate uh, English to German. One way I might do that, I would first uh, make a little network which would take my English sentence and translate it to a set of German words. Then what I would do is I would create a discriminator which would determine if the input was just a random set of words or a German sentence. And I would train these two until I translated the English sentence to a German sentence. Might not have the same meaning, but that's okay. Then I take uh, the German sentence and translate it to a set of English words. I then use the discriminator to get an English sentence, and then I train the whole thing until the sentence I get back is equivalent to the sentence I put in. And once you do this, the German sentence here is a, usually a good translation of the English sentence. And this just starts to show you uh, how this notion of a discriminator is going to be used in many problems and what we can do with it. Uh, next thing I want to talk about uh, is learning from a single image. Uh, because right now, when we train a network, uh, we train it with a thousand images for each category. And um, that's, uh, it takes a lot of work, and uh, somehow you would like to be able to train your network from a single image. And one of the things I did when my daughter was just maybe two or three years old is I had a book called The Best Word Book Ever. Uh, and we used to sit on the couch, and initially I would go through and I'd point to a picture and I'd say dog, cat, house, tree, etc. And after a little while, I'd start pointing to them and she would say dog, house, tree, etc. Uh, but uh, one day, uh, in this book, by the way, the only picture of a fire engine is the one on the cover. And one day we were out for a walk, and she said, Dad, fire engine. From a single image, she learned the concept of fire engine, even though the fire engine looks quite different uh, from the picture. 
Um, and the question is, is how did she do that? And it's possible that uh, a child in the first few years sees billions of pictures and learns how to classify pictures. That that's, that's what they learn. And, and by the way, there's a lot of research now on how the brain develops. And I, I mentioned earlier, I think most of you heard this, that in the first two years of a child's life, uh, the brain learns how to learn. And I, I don't know if, if I told you about the, when I was talking to a researcher, uh, and in the, when you're dealing with children, if you try to stabilize the first two years, to see what the uh, effect is, you have to wait 25 years. And so I said, it must be hard to do research if you have to wait 25 years to see what the result is. And they said, oh, no, no, no. Uh, we use the mouse as a proxy for humans. Uh, the brain in the mouse develops very similar to the way the brain in a human develops. And so they would put some mice in a rich environment for three weeks. And then they would put them in cages uh, with other mice and after two years, they tested the two sets of mice on mazes and things like that. And the ones that had been in the rich environment outperformed the others drastically. Uh, of course, I asked the question, what's a rich environment for a mouse? <laughs> uh, and uh, they sent me a picture and they labeled each item as to what part of the brain it developed. And for example, there is a ball and when the mouse hits the ball, it rolls. And so that helps it learn. It's just, it's having a complex, a more complex uh, environment than just being in a cage. Um, Okay, so one of the things that's important is for us to start to figure out how to train uh, a, a network to learn from individual pictures. And there's a lot of research on all of these things. I'm just trying to give you a simple uh, explanation. But here's a picture of a cat. And what I did is I went and, what did I do? Great, good. Um, I went into this cat and I changed just a few pixels. Uh, you probably can't even tell what pixels I changed. Uh, but guess what? The deep network realized that that wasn't a cat, that it was an automobile. <laughs> uh, and this is called fooling. And this is something we have to start to understand. Uh, because remember that this is technology is going to drive your automobile. Uh, and that, so that's an issue. Uh, it turns out you can take an image and with a minor modification, you can change it. With, with high probability, you can change it to any category you want. And the question is, is you know, what's, what's going on here? How, how is this happening? Uh, the, the, the current state of artificial intelligence is simply pattern recognition in high dimensional space. Um, the reason I, I mention that is if you put in an image that looks of something that looks like a bicycle but does not have the function of a bicycle, uh, the deep network is going to say it's a bicycle. Whereas a human would look at it and say, wait a minute, I can't get on that object and uh, cycle over to the subway stop. So we can't, we have to learn how to extract function. And I, I put on here, there's going to be another revolution in 40 years. And where did I get that from? Uh, there's been a number of revolutions in human existence, and they seem to be coming 10 times faster. And the time since the uh, Industrial Revolution to this Information Revolution was 400 years. So I suspect in 40 years, we'll have another major advance. And at that time, we may be able to extract functions of objects. Um, people always ask this question, is artificial intelligence real? Uh, the difficulty with answering it, well, I answer it no is what I say, but uh, the difficulty with answering it is I no longer have a definition of intelligence. I used to think intelligence was the ability to solve complex problems. Uh, but it turns out computers can solve complex problems uh, in ways that I would not call intelligence at all. It's simply computing power. Uh, another, I want to put up a, a picture of an object. Um, if you had trained your network 
uh, to recognize railroad cars and engines and things like that. Uh, it would probably classify this as either a flat car with something sitting on it or a box car. But if you look at it carefully, you'll probably notice that there's motors on the wheels and you would say it was an engine. Uh, what's, the reason it looks different than an engine is there's no cab for the person to sit in to drive it. And the reason for that is it's radio controlled. Uh, in a switchyard where they arrange the cars, freight cars for a train, uh, they use an engine with nobody in it. It's just computer controlled. Uh, so what is deep learning in intellectually? Um, it's simply pattern recognition in high dimensional space. That, that just gets back that we don't extract the function of, of an object. Uh, here, here is a slide on uh, how computers now can play chess. Uh, 30 or 40 years ago, I thought if you could train a computer to play chess, that would be real intelligence. Uh, but it's not because the way the computer works is it creates a game tree. And when you play chess, you examine the very po possible moves. What would happen if you made a move and your opponent made a move and then you made a move? And you can explore a little of this tree. Uh, the computer can explore it much deeper than you can. And that's why the computer can beat you. Now, I, I should say the computer doesn't... Uh, search the whole tree, it, it uses some code to say this part of the tree is not worth searching. Uh, it's a little bit more sophisticated, but there's no intelligence going on. It's purely computing power. So with that, uh, I'm going to thank you for giving me this opportunity to tell you a little bit about deep learning and research going on. We have some time, so uh, we can open the floor for one or two questions. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to uh, go to the mic and then just raise a question. Yeah. Yes. Thank you so much uh, for this excellent presentation. Uh, so deep learning has been used and uh, or we try to apply it in different fields of science uh, to identify, for example, um, different structures in physics, in, uh, in microscopy images in physics, biology, or chemistry. So over there, do you think that we could use some, uh, how can I say, physical constraints that come uh, from other scientific fields to somehow train a little bit uh, better uh, these kind of algorithms? Right. Uh, one thing I... Uh, one, one thing I should say is that deep learning is just one tool in the AI toolbox. And we probably have to add logic to it in, in order to do more complex things. Uh, but the, the thing which is really interesting to me right now is why is deep learning so successful? Uh, and nobody really understands why it works. It's, so, uh, it's also, however, quite strange that if you change a, a few pixels of this cut image, you will get an automobile. So sometimes it doesn't work. So could we, how could we improve it in these, uh, you know, uh, strange cases? This is uh, um, my question and generally uh, what I'm looking for. Uh, right. Uh, you're, you're pointing out a very important area. And what I think is probably the most important thing for researchers to do but that's not the problem they're working on. Uh, it turns out that researchers like to publish papers. And so they're working in application areas uh, trying to show that deep learning works. But at some point, they're going to have to stop doing that and start answering questions like you're asking. Uh, how, why does this work? And so forth. Uh, by, by the way, if you're interested in that area, uh, one of the things that I observed is in, in trying to figure out why it worked, uh, trying to do things mathematical, uh, the difficulty I had is I did not have a mathematical description of a cat image. And that prevented me from doing things. 
So one might generate a new category of images where the categories have mathematical definitions. And that might give you a tool which would allow you to start doing things theoretical. Yeah. Okay. Just one more question, anybody? Thank you for the presentation. I had one question concerning the energy consumption. Uh, so w when we saw AlphaGo that beat the Go player, but one consumed maybe 20 watts, the other one one terawatt. So my question is, how do you think we can work on more efficient right. artificial intelligence? Uh, that, that's an excellent question, and a lot of researchers are working on it. Uh, because uh, computers today are consuming enormous amounts of energy. And people are, are, are working on how do you develop computers which will be far more energy efficient. And if you look at the brain, the brain uses very little energy and does a much better job than we're doing with enormous amounts of energy. Uh, so th th these are important research problems. And the one thing I should say is, you know, I, I just gave a simple talk because I assume most of you were not in computer science. Uh, but there is fundamental research going on in all kinds of directions. Uh, and what you should find is something that you're excited about. And then talk to some researchers in that area and see what's, what's known and, and, and explore it. But it's an excellent question because energy consumption is a real problem. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Hopkoft.